And now I would like to um, introduce Dr. Amy Burton Alston, uh, our third speaker of this session. Uh, Dr. Amy Barton is a highly accomplished clinical pharmacist who brings over 20 years of exceptional experience as an academic researcher to her current role as science lead for nanomedicine at CLS uh, V4. Her unparalleled expertise in translational investigations of intravenous iron carbohydrate nanomedicine has been recognized by prestigious institutions such as FDA, Food and Drug Administration, which founded her research to advance by equivalence evaluation of nanomedicines using in vitro and preclinical models. Her outstanding contributions to the field have earned her honor, the honor of being a fellow of the esteemed American Society of Nephrology, National Kidney Foundation, and the American College of Clinical Pharmacy. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Amy Barton Alston. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. Can everyone hear me in the back? I feel like I might be the only US representative today, but I do work for a Swiss company. It's my pleasure to be here today, and I really commend the programming committee. These opportunities for students really make all the difference. I've heard some recurring themes today, um, the first one being um, opportunistic and um, also navigating your career based on what you might perceive as, as failure. I will say, and I think everyone um, who, who's spoken today can concur that in your career, it's always uncharted territory. The most important thing is to be curious and stay um, engaged and perhaps a little bit entrepreneurial in these days. Standard disclosure here, these are going to be obviously my views as I walk through my career. I'm not gonna share a ton of science today. Rather, what I'd like to do is just uh, share examples of my research enterprises and how I ultimately use those to transition to pharmaceutical industry. It's a bit of a backward story. You often hear of bench to bedside in terms of translational research. I'm going to take you on a journey that's really bedside, taking care of patients um, on a daily basis and transitioning into essentially a basic science role where I now manage our preclinical regulatory science portfolio focused on our iron carbohydrate nanomedicine products. So a little bit about me, I'm obviously from the US. I am from New York State, which I now know is not the home of the first skyscraper. Um, I'm ab about two hours north of New York City. I grew up in the very bucolic and beautiful Hyde Park, New York, which is pictured here. That's across the street from my childhood home um, on a museum space that was uh, owned by the railroad heirs, the Vanderbilts. Um, also, it was the last stop for the commuter chain, train, so I often spent a lot of time in New York City, um, which kind of derailed uh, my success in high school, which I'll, I'll get to a little bit. I do have two adultish kids. Um, they're 19 and 23. Uh, they do not want to be pharmacists, um, so I appreciate your dad's lamenting, um, but they are finding their own way. And I'm very passionate about ballet and also obscure indie music. So my path to pharmacy was very serendipitous. Um, I was a bit of a lackluster high school student. Um, I had other interests outside the academy, if you will, but I ended up getting a job in a pharmacy. And it's singular humans that make all the difference. It was a pharmacist who saw my potential and started describing structures of penicillin and cephalosporin to me as a house with a garage and a house with a garage and basement which sort of allowed me to conceptualize that I might be able to actually achieve a career in science. And so I worked at numerous pharmacies before I decided to ultimately pursue that as a career. But I first had to ultimately convince my parents <laughs> who were unclear that I could be successful in pharmacy school. In the US, we have sort of A levels, so I went to community college to enhance my academic record, which I did very successfully, and then I transferred to pharmacy school. Um, Albany College of Pharmacy, which is located um, about two and a half hours north of New York City. I got my bachelor's in 1996, but I felt I wanted to do something more. I loved working with patients, I loved being a pharmacist, but there was something about the research enterprise that really excited me. 
um, but like most students, we didn't get a huge amount of exposure. Um, and then one day the dean offered in one of our standard uh, seminars um, an opportunity to visit New York City and work at Will Cornell uh, in the Department of Clinical Pharmacology. So I went and spent six weeks there and spent time doing HPLC um, and ischemia reperfusion models, things I'd never been exposed to as a pharmacy student. And this is ultimately what spurred my interest in really doing translational science before I even really knew it was a word. Back then, as a pharmacist, there were a couple routes you could go. I was undecided if I wanted to pursue a PhD. Um, those of you in it know it's a very long road, um, and I was unclear how I wanted to navigate this. So I chose to do another experience called a pharmacy practice residency, which is equivalent to maybe like a year one internship for a physician where we get general clinical exposure in a hospital while I sorted out my thoughts on this. Ultimately, that experience paid for some courses um, in my doctor of pharmacy, and I decided to finish that up and pursue a doctor of pharmacy versus uh, a PhD. Still unclear whether I could achieve my goal as a translational scientist with um, a PharmD. So then I went on um, to really try to get some more detailed research experience. Uh, again, at the time, um, pharmacists would normally go into a postdoctoral fellowship program, which are typically two years in length. And I did that at the University of Illinois at Chicago for two years um, and specialized in nephrology. After finishing my fellowship, I spent two decades in academia um, at three different institutions. Another theme I've heard from the various speakers is this need to switch it up. And I completely occur, concur with that, that there are times in your journey as a scientist that you need a different experience. And um, even though I had to start my lab three different times, I think those experiences really um, led me to the position where I am today. I started out at the University of New Mexico, which kind of feels like going to Texas from New York. <laughs> Not totally dissimilar. Um, Totally new culture and experience for me, um, but a public university and had pretty good resources. I then went back to my alma mater um, in 2008, which was mainly a personal decision um, based on my kids and my parents at the time, um, and then finally ended up uh, before transitioning to industry at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy. So my research enterprise as someone coming from a clinical background uh, could be described as all over the place. And this was often a criticism I had in my dossier. I really wanted to generate research endeavors that actually benefited patients in my perhaps lifetime, which is very difficult. Um, so I had two real paradigms that I went after. Um, the first one was really focused on these iron carbohydrate nanoparticles. I became interested in them through the clinical treatment of anemia and dialysis patients. Those are the patients where my practice mainly centered on. But I also then um, sought to do some more translational studies. I really wanted to understand the differences between the product in terms of how they could induce oxida oxidative stress and inflammation, which is a major uh, disease profile in the kidney disease population. And this really led me into um, labile release profiling from these drugs, which as I bundle this up, you'll see has led me to this position. Um, in that vein, really, I think any pharmacist um, has an effort to understand the PK and PD of drugs, and I was certainly uh, surprised to find out that these iron carbohydrate products, which had been around for decades, really didn't have well-described PK, PD profiles. Then as a pharmacist, I still was very tied to clinical practice. It, it's something that um, really drove my passion for science and I felt that I needed to stay connected to patient care. So I did have an enterprise um, around innovative pharmacy practice models, um, health literacy and OTC labeling, um, and other public health, health initiatives. So I do have a body of work that's kind of tucked under there, although I'll be obviously focusing on the iron um, enterprise. So during fellowship, um, I would say that my mentorship maybe wasn't as good as it could be, um, and many of you will experience this as well. It's how do you then pivot and understand where you're missing perhaps key mentorship um, components. I spent a lot of time as a study co 
coordinator, boots on the ground, enrolling patients, getting samples, going to the institutional review board, which at times made me feel a bit bored, but ultimately what doing these clinical trials meant was that I wrote really good protocols because I read them inside, outside, upside down, the investigator brochure. So it was a skill that got distilled on me a little bit later that I didn't fully appreciate. I did start my translational work in my fellowship looking at cytochrome P453A4 activity using erythromycin breath tests. So this was, again, my first activity to get a protocol through, go to IRB, enroll all the patients, do the data analysis, et cetera. What did I learn in my postdoc? Mentorship is critical and also political. Um, and those navigations um, need to be conferred upon with people you trust. Um, and I've heard repeatedly, there are so many people out there willing to help. I still remain open to all of my trainees over the past 20 years and still get calls just to navigate even a little career um, hiccup or a switch. Um, you know, if you find someone like that, it, it's really like gold uh, having mentorship like that. Um, again, as I alluded to, although I found phase two and three trials a little bit boring, they did give me the skills to write excellent um, investigational protocols. And then finally, I would just uh, dovetail this as you start, if you decide to have a research enterprise in a lab, um, really have a deep understanding of all the processes that you can then treat, uh, teach to your research assistants. I would routinely invest somewhere between six and eight months of a lot of investment um, in my research assistants, including undergrads who would stay with me for years or even six if they were doing um, graduate work. And then they become quite autonomous and really understand the research process. Um, transitioning to my first faculty position, I was always in tenure track faculty positions. I have gone up for promotion and tenure three times at three different institutions. So I, I have a bit of a profession around dossier preparation um, and they're all different. Um, funding. Very tough when you're first out there. Um, again, coming from um, a fellowship versus a PhD, it's even more challenging. So I just tried everything. Um, and so this notion of failure, you will fail with those initial grants, but the reviewer's comments are generally 90 2% of the time pretty helpful in improving your application. But I did get some foundation grants. I was supported through our NIH Clinical and Translational Research Center, which was a huge benefit. Um, and through that, I was able to actually have lab space. So I came into this position without any lab space and I was able to secure lab space. But then I quickly realized I needed research staff. So one of my smartest moves was hiring an excellent lab manager. Um, to really propel this um, translational work. These are some publications of those initial efforts, um, really looking at um, the patient exposure to iron carbohydrate products and, and the effects on oxidative stress. What did I realize from this huge body of work? That ultimately uh, humans are very difficult to study. Um, this is a very complicated milieu. Um, most of my data, I'll be honest, in this realm were equivocal. Um, so that's what really motivated me to get into uh, a more in vitro model or a preclinical model so that I could then backtrack back into the bedside initiative and understand which analytes would be best. Um, the lowest, uh, or the publication on the bottom here, this is when I started to also liaise with industry. Um, so that's something I did my entire career. Um, you know, it really depends on your institution, whether they um, see that as a positive or perhaps a negative. For me, I felt like I needed to stay on the cutting edge of all drugs that were going to be used in my patient population. Um, and so I started to work with industry very early in my career. Transitioning back to my alma mater, I had to again restart my lab um, and build uh, networks, which I already had to some extent, but of note, when you go from a different university, so I was in a public university to a private, a small private university, the resources are not um, as apparent or uh, available, so that needs to be taken into consideration if you're going to make a switch. 
It was in this position where I got quite a bit more funding, continued to work on some industry trials, but uh, in 2013, I received significant funding from the US FDA um, to advance bioequivalence evaluation for the iron carbohydrate products. And this was really the game changer for me, which allowed me to explore this more translational space and also build my credibility in the field. At the same time, I also became the chair of my department, um, which is a very difficult balance. So uh, I will s sort of walk you through that. So at that point, I was unclear whether I would really just want to go an entire research route or whether I was on a track to essentially become a dean at a college of pharmacy. So this is the project, and this is sort of the science light I will show you today, but um, again, it will thread through how I ultimately ended up in this position. So the task, um, this was an FDA, it was a request for application. Uh, typically FDA, when they have these, it has a six week turnaround. So you have to write the entire grant um, and submit it within six weeks of the request for application being released. Um, what was fortuitous, um, for this project, as you'll note on bold in the bottom, is I developed a partnership with General Electric Healthcare. The main aim of this study was really to take th the iron carbohydrate products through a full physical chemical characterization, to look at the labile iron release in an in vitro model, and then to bring that all the way through a preclinical uh, model of labile iron profiles in rats was the species we used, and then to subsequently use those data to try to construct a viable in vitro to in vivo uh, correlation model. I did not have any of the equipment to do physical chemical characterization of nanomedicines, but GE Healthcare did. It was a perfect partnership because they wanted to have some more uh, public-private um, innovation um, and collaboration, so it worked out very well. So essentially in this study, we studied um, six available compounds. Um, these are all available in the United States. There was one RLD Fairless set and the generic, which is sodium ferric gluconate complex. That generic was already approved by the FDA, so this was a bit of a post hoc um, bioequivalence, a deeper dive for FDA um, to really advance for the next generics the criteria for an ANDA submission. I will say from this uh, project that we were ultimately not successful in developing an in vitro to in vivo correlation model, but what it did underscore to me is that there were many research gaps remaining for this class of drugs that needed to be addressed before such an IVIVC could really be utilized in any regulatory capacity. Um, and if these slides are circulated, um, if you had any interest in the details of this project, uh, I presented recently to the Center for Research on Complex Generics, which is a center funded by FDA at the University of Maryland and the University of Michigan. So what this ultimately did, obviously I published from this project, but what I started to do was really um, submit more editorials or respond to requests to submit editorials so that my name would become associated with labile iron profiling um, and those types of endeavors. Um, and that's really ultimately what led me to this position. However, I will note now I'm the department chair and have a pretty significant grant from FDA, so I'm still sort of on two paths and not sure that I can maintain them both. Um, so I really was starting to feel a bit restless and I wanted to advance um, what I thought would be the next great move for me, which was my leadership skills. Um, innovation, we've heard it today, was a buzzword, but really what does it ultimately mean? I decided to start a master's program in healthcare innovation at the uh, Arizona State University. Um, which actually was an innovator of this program, um, and it's been duplicated uh, across the United States. Um, ultimately, when I was recruited to Michigan, I built the tuition, which unfortunately in the US is a huge <laughs> cost. I built it into my startup package, so um, that was really nicely enveloped in there, so I was able to do that when I started my new position. But this master's really was 
quite dynamic um, in that it focused on use of evidence and decision making for innovations. It also talked more deeply about disruption, another word I had frequently heard, but didn't really know the impact of engaging in such an activity. If you're disrupting, you better be prepared to then walk people through the entire journey. Also, just financing for these types of endeavor endeavors and just core entrepreneurship, and I finished that in 2018. And that's me um, in about a 43 degree Celsius day in Phoenix when we graduated. So in 2015, approximately, I was recruited to the University of Michigan. Um, and so my thought at that time was, I'm going to the number one public university. And the resources are plentiful, the infrastructure is plentiful, I will know for sure whether you know, research is my career or administration. Um, so reestablish my lab for the third time. Um, however, I will note that time um, was particularly challenging for funding. And for someone who had restarted their lab three times, um, and anyone who's worked in a lab environment knows that all your lab personnel are very close to you, and you bear a huge burden on your shoulders to keep your lab funded. Uh, and it's deeply personal. Um, and for me, I just decided it was time to change that up and really work in a more cross-functional team model so that I could really give what I had to offer intellectually but have a little bit better um, work-life balance, if you will. Um, I also found at that time after 20 years that teaching unfortunately had become onerous for me and less rewarding and I thought that was actually disingenuous to my students to continue teaching in that capacity. So these factors are what really led me to think about switching to industry. So I wasn't sure where to go. I knew that I probably didn't want to be customer facing. I am a clinician, so the natural fit for industry might be a more customer facing position, but I'm a scientist um, and in a very niche area, so I wasn't sure exactly how to build that out. But what I decided to do was partner with publications that really talked about these emerging issues with regulatory science among these um, intravenous iron carbohydrate nanomedicines. And I also um, sat on clinical guidelines and developed clinical guidelines so that um, I could be best positioned in this arena. I had a numerous collateral benefits from an academic career. Um, obviously, through publications and grants, that's how you get an enduring reputation, but this is also how you build the genuine relationships that might be the springboard to your next career initiative. Teaching and mentoring were extremely valuable and rewarding to me. I maintained a clinical practice in dialysis units for 20 years. That's where I took pharmacy students. Um, and truly enjoyed those activities. I mentored pharmacy residents and pharmacy fellows, um, and also my clinical research assistants, who I often would take in their earliest years of undergrad when they thought they couldn't do this work, and they would become very accomplished at navigating the entire research process, um, and very accomplished, honestly, junior scientists, um, and they were an absolute pleasure uh, to have in my lab. I also became involved through in public policy, which is something that changes when you go to industry, people's reception to you participating in those roles, but I had a very active role with the NIH working on the National Kidney Disease Education Program, um, and also with the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services, which um, in the US is the insurance that covers dialysis. So there's a lot of quality measures um, that are tied into things like anemia, um, and other diseases that CMS oversees. Travel is a great collateral benefit. I met numerous colleagues. If you would have told me when I was sitting in my tiny pharmacy in Hyde Park, New York, that I would someday be in Lausanne, Switzerland, giving a talk about nanomedicines, I certainly wouldn't have believed you. And then the other piece is consulting. Um, a lot of folks here have talked about their spinoff. I created a, um, a small business for consulting, um, so I consulted with the company I actually work for now, but also several other companies who are interested in producing iron carbohydrate products, which both gave me knowledge and depth in the field, but also, again, more networks in the industry. So 2020 is when I made this tr transition. It started out great. I onboarded in Zurich at the end of February 2020, and then I didn't see my entire team for 18 months. 
Um, so a bit of a, a shocking career transition, going from a very multifaceted, busy career to working from home and building sort of this new um, position, which is the science lead for nanomedicine. Um, so I work more on the biologic side. We have someone uh, more on the physical chemical characterization side. We're a small team of five. Um, and essentially we oversee, again, our preclinical regulatory science portfolio around iron therapies. So CSLV4 is headquartered. Um, the, CS, the V4 component of CSL, we were really recently acquired, so I got to experience that as well, um, is an inherently Swiss company which started in the 1840s in St. Gallen, and our manufacturing still exists in St. Gallen. In 1952, they produced the first IV iron therapy, which was a nanoparticle. Um, so this obviously existed before nanomedicine science was actually a domain. So a lot of what our group does is retrofits really current contemporary orthogonal methods around recharacterization, if you will, of these uh, products which have been in clinical use for many decades. And we're still learning quite a bit. Um, so we have two fundamental products, um, iron sucrose and ferric carboxymaltose. They're both quite different, but they're both mainstays of iron therapy. So again, I kind of articulated what my job is now. I have a, my manager is Dr. Bayat Fluman, who manages the global aspects of nanomedicine. Something that I have truly appreciated is developing autonomy in my position on the US ground. So he manages Europe and other territories. And of course, we cross pollinate. Um, so I get to design um, our strategy and manage our research portfolio around the preclinical nanomedicine science. So I will say fundamentally what we do is we look at what regulators are interested in, what is au courant in the regulatory field, and then we either get ahead of it or, for example, I know there's a lot of computational scientists and data scientists here, um, a computational method like physiologic-based PK is something that can't really yet be established for this class of drugs because we don't actually know how they're biodegraded, for example, in other parts of the metabolic pathway. So we might try to get ahead of that and do our own research to really advance the field and make sure um, best practices are followed. Um, the other piece I really enjoy is the policy piece. So I interface on the regular with the Food and Drug Administration. Um, I had an opportunity to give a talk to their off, to the office of the chief counsel, so it was sort of like coming full circle. You gave me this grant. <laughs> I learned a lot, and now I'm work, working for this company. Um, but it definitely allows me to have that credibility with FDA um, on these very uh, deep scientific topics. The other piece I also enjoy is I still get to teach to some extent. Some of our initiatives are really targeted at educating clinicians and pharmacists because, as I mentioned, the nanomedicine domain is rather new. Um, but ultimately, um, when you look at this, you really need to enhance curricula for these programs. And I see time is ticking, so I will kind of go through this quickly. But we've been able to publish quite prolifically with other partners. In fact, I've bundled my site visits um, into this trip, so I'll be in Freeborg tomorrow. Um, but these are very helpful publications for both regulators and scientists working in the field. And then we also do position ourselves to discuss what's necessary for nanomedicine education. So just to wrap up here, <laughs> I don't know what the Swiss analog is to Bigfoot. I meant to ask my team before I came here. But my career was not lockstep, as I've heard pretty much all of the other speakers articulate today. Um, you have to follow your own path, but you know, again, having great mentors or great dialogue with, with your network is important. Um, there's perhaps nothing more important than mentorship, as I articulated, so give it back double. If you're in a position to mentor, um, you know, take the shortfalls of your mentorship and, and move that forward. Um, and then finally, imposter syndrome is real. I have been mired in it for my entire career. We all have. 
So don't think if you're feeling, you know, a little intimidated or a little like your failures um, seem insurmountable. We have all been there and we are certainly willing to dialogue to help you get to the next step. The final piece here is life work balance. It is elusive, it's like Bigfoot, but keep looking for it. You'll know when you have it. When you think you have it, but you're not sure, you don't have it. <laughs> and I encourage you to contact me through any mechanism possible, and I'll leave you with a quote from Neil Young, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Amy Bart. for your